in the middle of a hot, muggy, reptile infested swamp. The water is only six inches deep here for 50 miles around. And this is what they call vegetable paddling. Hi, I'm John Veeman. Join me in the largest chunk of wilderness on the East Coast, Everglades National Park in Florida, as we make our own adventure on Trailside. Everglades has been described as a giant 50 mile wide river with fresh water flowing north to south at a rate of a half mile a day. We'll begin on a river within that river called the Turner, which starts about a mile down this canal. About two miles down is a dense mangrove forest, the largest in the world. Within that forest is the 10,000 islands, and they stretch out to the Gulf of Mexico. While the best way to see this place is in a shallow draft boat like this solo canoe, it's still a place that you quickly can get in over your head. There are plenty of natural obstacles like the mangrove maze and only a few dry land campsites. So you want to make sure you know where you're going or hook up with a good friend who's been there before. Hey John, don't forget the gator repellent. Yeah, right. Well, Barty Jones has been paddling these waters since 1967 when he and his friends started paddling the mangrove tunnels of the Turner. He's also been guiding trips in the Everglades for the past 17 years. And he's known as an accomplished solo canoeist. Hey, he's even got a boat named after him, the BJX. What's the X stand for anyway? It stands for Express. Express? Yeah, it's designed to be a real long skinny boat that'd be real fast for cruising through the Everglades. So something that's gonna cover the miles real efficiently, huh? That's right, and we got a lot of them to cover. Yeah. I see you got a nice bench shaft paddle there. You brought a straight stick too? Uh-huh. This one's gonna be real important when we get up in those mangrove tunnels. It's got great maneuverability. These days, paddles come in all shapes and sizes. So let's start with the shaft. Now this paddle isn't warped. The shaft is actually bent to increase efficiency. As you move the paddle through your stroke, the bend helps you avoid lifting water with your paddle blade and instead moves you forward through the water. Now bench shaft paddles are designed primarily for straight ahead power paddling. For steering they might feel a little squirrely so if it's control and maneuverability you want you might want to reach for a straighter shaft paddle. Now another important part of the paddle of course is the blade and the most important thing here is the blade size. You might think that a larger blade will help you go faster, but in fact, the opposite is true. Take this marathon canoe racing paddle with a very small blade. It's designed to help you maintain a very fast cadence. And canoe racers maintain a cadence of like 80 strokes per minute. And they want to have the paddle out of the water as little as possible. The smaller blade size is also less tiring on your arms. When it comes to materials, most people prefer the natural flex and warmth of wood. But the high-tech synthetics like that 14 ounce carbon fiber racing paddle can shave pounds off the weight of your paddle. Well, Barty, any last minute tips before we head out? Well, yeah, there's uh, three essentials that you always gotta watch out for when you head out around here. And that's water and sun protection and insect protection. Okay, now we've got two different containers for our water. One's hard, one's soft. Is there a reason for that? Well, yeah, we're gonna be going out to the Gulf Coast Islands there, water is tougher to come by for the raccoons, yeah. so we got a, an armored water container for out there. We'll use this one up first and rely on this one when we get out there. Okay, how much water do we need? We use about three quarts a day. And now for sun protection, what are we using there? Well, we got our hats, that's the most important thing. Yeah. And we've got some good waterproof sunscreen, mm -hmm. and then we've got some stuff for our lips. And you mentioned bugs? This yeah. is winter, there's no bugs down here. Well, even in the winter time, you can have bugs in the Everglades. So you always need some kind of insect protection, some uh -huh. kind of insect repellent, and then some kind of the skin softener. That's really good for the uh, sandflies. Where are we gonna run into sandflies? Well, out on the Gulf beaches, if the wind dies, you can sometimes get some. Well, what do you say we pack up and get on out of here? That sounds great to me.
Hey, Bertie, you want to use some of my alligator spray? <laughs> no thanks, John. I'll take my chances. Seriously, Bertie, how much of a concern are alligators? Well, anytime you're in the freshwater zone of the Everglades, you have to assume there's going to be alligators. Mm -hmm. But we may see one up in here. Where would they be hanging out? Where would we expect to see them? Well, they'd be over on a sunny bank collecting some solar energy. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you see a log watching you, that's going to be an alligator. Or a very alert log. Is that an airboat coming this way? Yeah. Well, that's kind of unnerving being here in this tall grass with a big boat like that coming your way. Yeah, it is. They can go like 50 miles an hour, take about 50 yards to stop. And I always carry something bright sitting on a stick or a paddle just so I can wave them down. Once they shut their power off, they don't have any steering either. Yeah. doing out here? I thought they weren't allowed in the park. Well, they're not. We're just outside the park. And once we get past the park boundary, we won't hear those guys anymore. Looks like we're coming out of that grassy area. Yeah, we're coming right up into the mangrove tunnel here. This is the red mangroves mark the transition from the freshwater down into the saltwater region. Uh huh. And what is it that's unique to this area that creates such a large mangrove forest? Well, you have a huge, gentle gradient that slopes from the freshwater grasslands down into the Gulf of Mexico. And that just creates a perfect climate for the uh, mangroves. And these mangroves have a, a root system that's just wonderful for grabbing your paddle. You know, oh. They'll just reach out and snatch it from your hands. Actually, that's, this is probably a real good place to switch our paddles and go to our straight shafts. Yeah, good idea. You said these were red mangroves. They look pretty green to me. Well, the, the bark is red, and especially if it's skinned a little bit. You'll see up here in the tunnels where it's uh, a whole lot redder. Tunnel? I don't see anything but a wall of bushes, Barty. I think I'll let you take the lead on this one. Okay. There's a little hole up here. You just got to sort of trust to faith and just dive on in. Okay. Well... My fate is in your hands. Now I'm going to trust you on it. Now this is tight. <laughs> Out. A lot of tight turning in here. Yeah. That head duck stroke is a brand new one on me. Well, making your way down a mangrove tunnel is a great place to practice some of your more basic turning strokes. And one of the most basic is the draw. To begin, you just take your paddle blade and place it 90 degrees to your body, plant it firmly using your bottom arm as a fulcrum, push out with your top. Same fulcrum off of the top. A variation is the cross draw. To do that, bring the paddle all the way to your off paddle side, Plant it firmly, use your bottom arm as a fulcrum, push out with the top. Now one of the more basic turning strokes, besides mangrove madness, is the pry. And that'll bring you quickly to the off paddle side. Just bring the paddle right in next to the canoe and just like the name, you pry off that top rail. It'll bring you quickly to that off paddle side. Well, I see light at the end of the tunnel, Barty. Yeah, we're almost through this one. Wait till you see that next one though. It's really great. John, hold up a second, hold up. Oh yeah? Yeah, we're going past the entrance. Really? Yeah, right over here to the right. That's where the entrance to the uh, Mod Long Tunnel is. Well, now I would have totally missed that. Actually, I did. 
Well, I missed it the first time. It's a real, it's the obvious way to go. If you hadn't been here before, how would you know the tunnel was there? Well, the real clue is the current. Yeah. That's, that's, except for your, your absolute lot local knowledge, having been here before, that's your only clue. Uh -huh. And you come over here and you can look at the leaves and the currents going past them and the roots and the currents going past those. If you go over there, the water's dead and it's real shallow that hasn't been scoured out by the current. Uh -huh. And you come over here and you can make some, make some splashing and make some bubbles. Yeah. And you can watch the bubbles and the bubbles will just slide right on down. Huh. And that's where we're going. Okay, well, you want to start? Sure. Let's switch paddles, get Good back idea. to the straighter shafts. All right. This one looks awful familiar, just yeah. like the last one. How long is this one, Barty? This one's one mile, the big tunnel. Well, you don't have any time to switch sides in here? No. Some new head strokes I'm learning down in this part. Got to watch where your head goes and where your yeah. paddle goes at the you same more time. Than, more than just your head to worry about. Here comes a sharp turn up here, Barty. Oh, hot dogging it, huh? You bet. Ah! <laughs> ah, the hang downs have me. You get extra points for putting your, uh, your pals in the bushes here. Time for vegetable paddling. Boy, there's a lot of current in here, isn't there? Yeah. All right. I almost got you back there. Almost? Yeah. Well, that was a fast mile, man. That's yeah. great. Well, I forgot it was a sunny day out. Yeah. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Okay, John, let's be real quiet in here. There's a couple mud banks up here on the left. Yep. And gators like to hang out there. So we might just get lucky and see one. So let's just take it real slow and quiet. Is there anything to be concerned about around gators? Not really. They're not really aggressive. In fact, there's never been a fatality in the park, which is comforting. Yeah. But you don't want to crowd them. And usually the problem with alligators is that when people feed them, they start to get confident. Uh-huh. There we go. Look at that. Now, is that a big one? Not real big. He's about six foot. Mm -hmm. But usually the closer you get to them, the bigger they look. <laughs> I'm going to come over a little bit closer to you. You say there's never been a fatality in the park? Never been a fatality. So in that case, we have nothing to worry about. I wouldn't want to wrestle with him. No, he's a little bit over the uh, wrestling size as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Now he's just up there to get warm? Yeah, he's just up there sunning himself. And as long as we don't get too close, he'll just stay there. Nice teeth. <laughs> yeah. And he hears everything you're doing. really opens up on here, doesn't it? Yeah. It's probably a good idea to stop and take a look at the maps. Here, I can pull mine out. Let's see where we are. Okay. Well, we're far enough down into the open water that we can get off of the topographical map here. Oh, really? Yeah, and start getting into the nautical chart. Okay. Well, you can see where we came from here, can't you? Mm-hmm. Right through all these mangroves and yeah. right into the, all the tidal areas. Now we pick it up on the chart here? Yeah, right over here. I'm coming right out here. Mm -hmm. And uh, once we get on the nautical chart, we pick up a lot more detail that comes real important to us. Right. We get water depth. We get navigational markers. We get campsites. Boy, this is really detailed, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lot easier to read, too, than the, than the topographic maps. 
So we're going to be cruising pretty much right through here, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. This looks like our chicky coming up. That's how you say it, isn't it? Chicky? Chicky, that's right. Chicky's a Seminole word, means dwelling. Uh -huh. And the Seminoles started using these when they first came to Florida. They were living out in the grasslands and they needed some place to get themselves up out of the water because mm -hmm. it'd flood a lot. Yeah. And so they came up with this chicky idea, and the Park Service has found it to be a perfect adaptation for out here in the 10,000 Islands. You get the feeling of being surrounded by the mangroves, but you don't have some of the disadvantages, like you're pretty coon-proof, and you don't have many bugs, and you also minimize the human impact. How many chickies are there in the park? It's about 12 of them. Most of them nowadays are the double kind like this, but a lot of the older ones are just a single chicky, single platform. Mm -hmm. This one's the deluxe model. It's even got an outhouse. Yeah. They got a, a boat called the Honey Barge that comes and pumps these things out. I hope it's been here recently. Yeah. This is nice. This is nice. Yeah. Now, this is the same design that the Seminoles would have, he would have used, or is this Well, different? roughly. The, the, the Seminoles would have built theirs out of cypress logs uh -huh. instead of this 4x4. Four four. Yeah. You know, cypress is their abundant wood, and it's really rot resistant, so it's mm -hmm. perfect for them. And they'd skin off the bark to keep bugs from crawling up into the roof. Right, right. Now, the, the roof itself, would it be flat or would it be more of a peaked roof? To They'd have a peaked roof, and that would, it was made out of thatched palmetto fronds, mm -hmm. and that would let the water run off real good. Okay. Real waterproof, real uh, cool in the summertime because it had a lot of thermal protection they'd, there. They'd leave the walls open like this year-round? The walls would be open. They'd usually have some kind of a windscreen that they could put up. Mm -hmm. And up under the peaked roof, up under the rafters, they'd have like lofts built in there. And that's where they'd put a lot of their personal possessions to keep them real dry. This is nice. We've got a place for cooking. We've got some cleats down here for tying the tents down at night. Yep, all the comforts of home. Well, what do you say we unload the boats and Sounds good. set up camp? Hey, John, I see you brought one of these screen tents along with you. Well, I figure with the hot, muggy nights down here, all that nice natural ventilation from the netting will really keep us cool at night and keep the condensation out of the tent, too. Absolutely. Give you a great view. Well, looks like camp's all set up. I think I'm going to go and do a little paddling. Okay. Well, while you do that, I'm going to work on some dessert. All right. It's not easy to bake down here. That is, unless you forgot your sunscreen. But that doesn't mean you can't be creative in the kitchen. Before coming to Florida, I stopped in and talked to trailside chef Annie Getchell for a recipe for key lime pie. And she swears that all you need is two-thirds cup sugar, a dash of salt, and an envelope of gelatin, the juice from three limes, and a can of condensed milk. So let's see how it all comes together. You start by mixing all the dry ingredients in a pot, there we go. You add the water. You mix that up and you heat it. Don't let it boil. You just let it sit there. Mix that up good and scrape in the sides. You mix that up good for about three minutes. And while that heats up, you want to make your pie crust. To make a pie crust in the field, you take butter and melt it into a pan, and then you take about a cup and a half of uh, broken up pie of graham cracker crumbs spread it around forming your pie crust. That's pretty much it. So then you take your filling off the heat, you stir in the juice from three limes, there we go, and set that aside to cool. Now while that's cooling, or once it's cooled, you whisk in the condensed milk, Ooh, tastes better than it looks, you whisk that up, Okay, and then you take some lime shavings, and they go, just like home movies. You mix that all up, pour it all into a crust. There we go. Spread that all around. Place it in a shady spot, and you just let it cool. In an hour, it's ready to eat. Let's see what Barty's up to. 
I know why you like these chickies, Barty. They're a natural obstacle course. Yeah, so are canoes. You got a patent for that move? No, not yet. That's sweet. This came out pretty good. I'll let you uh, have the first one. Give it a try. Wow, that looks great. Yeah. Mmm, not bad. It's outstanding. Hey, tomorrow I might even try apple pie. All right. We got a pretty good crossing tomorrow out to the Gulf Islands. You want to check out the weather while we're sure. hanging out? Sure. Good idea. Yeah. That'll be nice to get out of the mangroves, huh? Yeah. Well, that was a nice leisurely paddle, but I'm pretty well warmed up after that cool night. Yeah, the weather's starting to shut down now, though. We're getting some rain. Well, what do you say we pull over before we head out into the gulf there and take a look? I like that idea. Boy, it is great to be out in some wide open country again after all those mangroves. Yeah. So, John, what do you see out there? Well, it looks pretty nasty, actually. There's like one foot, one foot waves, and the tops are being blown right off them. So what do you think we got for wind speed out there? Well, the tops are being blown off. We've got a 15. Yeah. But I've, some of these gusts are probably up at least 20. Yeah. Well, that forecast from the Weather Service wasn't far off. Then. No. They're a little bit off on the wind direction. They were saying everything's coming out of the northwest, mm -hmm. and uh, we're getting stuff out of the northeast. Okay, so what's our plan here to get out to Pavilion Key? Well, we're sitting here on Gun Rock, mm -hmm. and normally we'd come out and go right out here if it was a calm day. Right. But it's so rough, I think we ought to stay real close to the mangroves and use them for shelter from the wind. Yeah, the wind's coming right from here. Mm -hmm. And get up around in this area and then see if we can make a run down to Pavilion. Yeah, and then we'd have it be having a nice tailwind almost. Exactly. Now, we also have an alternative. If we get up there and we just think it's too rough or if we listen to the forecast for tomorrow on the radio mm -hmm. and that sounds too bad, we can just keep working our way up the coast and camp up at Rabbit Key. Yeah. Probably not a good idea to go out there if it's going to be socking us in tomorrow, is it? Yeah, I'd hate to get stuck there for a couple of days. Let's get in the boats. Okay. Now, let's see, we want to be We've got side wind coming off of our front quarter, so we want to trim about dead level. Pretty much dead level, yeah. Yeah. And then we're gonna, if we're gonna make that run down to Pavilion, we'll load them a little bit heavy in the stern, just so we can track down wind real well. Thanks. Boy, this tide's dropping. Oh yeah. There's a quite a wind out here. How's my trim look, Barty? Uh, a little bit bow light. All right, I'll put some weight up in front then. How about uh, me? Well, you look pretty good. You might want to bring it back a click. You look a little bit bow heavy. Back? Okay. Yep. What do you think? Should we cross the bay or stick to the coast? Let's cross the bay. Okay. Waves look like they're holding pretty steady. Yeah, we can do it. Just keep our nose into the wind. Yep. When I came into the Everglades, I thought I'd find muck, mangroves, and mosquitoes. Instead, I found a challenging mix of terrain, water, and weather. It all means you have to stay flexible and adapt to the conditions. But it's great canoe country. See you next time on Trailside. Well, where do you think we should set up tent here? Oh, I think over there it looks pretty good. It's got some shelter. Any other strange stories about the key? 
There was an old guy named Chevalier who lived out here. He was a contemporary of Ed Watson. Huh? There's a bay up there back where we came through called Chevalier Bay. Mm -hmm. And he had a house out here. And there was a French woman passing through this area, and she had three daughters and a grand piano. And she lived there for a while. No kidding. Yeah. You can just imagine the social splash a French woman with three daughters and a grand piano made out in an isolated place like this. Yeah. How long did that last? Well, about until she heard about Miami, and she jumped on a ship, and she was out of here. Hey, Barty, it's nice and warm out. Don't you think it'd be a great time for a swim? Oh, yeah. Well, at least you wouldn't have to worry about alligators out here. Everybody's so friendly down here. This is Pete the Pelican. His beak can hold more than his belly can. Hi, Pete. Oh, oh. Uh, guys, we're about ready to come in and block this thing out and, uh, and do it. Wouldn't mind doing one more. You wouldn't mind doing another one? Let's do the wild sound right do now. Do this though. wild track right here. And Rolling. You want me to be walking? 52, take two. And action! Hey, Mr. Beeman. It's Captain Trailside! Oh my god! Oh my god! Filming an outdoor television show is a bit of a dance, but shooting in the Everglades is more like a ballet. The camera moves have to be more precise, and the conditions, at least this time out, mean you have to be ready to roll on cue. Fortunately, cameraman Jeff Wayman spends his free time at dance camps. To get many of the dramatic overhead shots while we're filming on water, Jeff climbs atop a rig that we affectionately christened Contiki. As you can see, it's actually two canoes strapped together with an attached 10-foot ladder. Typically, that Contiki hovers around the action under power from the rest of the crew while Jeff tries to keep us in frame. When we slipped into the mangrove tunnels, the Contiki was out of the question, of course, so Jeff climbed aboard my canoe. And I had to do my best juggling act with the additional 200 pounds in the bow, not to mention the $50,000 worth of camera equipment. You don't make mistakes with that kind of cargo on board. Some of these limbs are like covered with orchids and airplanes. We also did some pretty fancy rigging on the Chickie to get a more dramatic angle on those scenes. and I were expecting the Everglades to be a hot, muggy, reptile-infested swamp, of course. But, you know, we found that it's really an amazing and challenging mix of water, weather, and terrain. We hit an unusually cold week, though, and temperatures dipped down into the 40s, so everyone had on every stitch of clothing pretty much through the whole shoot. By far the most intriguing aspect to a Glades experience has to be the camping out on the chickies. You know, the raised platforms that are just big enough for a couple tents and really not many more people. You can easily delude yourself into thinking you're all alone out there. At least that's until nightfall. As I did a circular scan around the chickies perimeter with my flashlight, about every 10 feet I'd catch two pink dots out there in the darkness. Gator eyes. Just as quickly as I found them, they'd drop out of sight. All in all, it's an off-season place to wet a paddle. There aren't many places quite like the Everglades. So what if we did get caught in a thunderstorm up here? Well, I get down below tree line really fast. Yeah, but what if you couldn't get down? Well, I get away from those rocks we just came down. I'd get down here, a little bit out in the open, get my pack off to reduce my body size. i get one of our insulated foam sleeping pads out, put it on the ground, and I'd stand on it in the balls of my feet, crouch down really low. Well, if the idea is to get really low, why wouldn't you just sprawl out on the rocks? Well, I want to reduce my contact area, and I, want to be, I don't want to be grounded. Huh? Hey, by the way, uh, you want to hold these metal poles? Yeah, yeah right. In a thunderstorm, I'd be as far away from those metal poles as I possibly could be. Hey, you know, you're notorious for having a science for just about everything. You must have a science for loading a kayak. I do. The basic principle is to keep the weight concentrated toward the balance point of the boat so that the ends are free to rise and fall. Uh -huh. 
So heavy things like water you'd keep right in the right in the middle here? In particular, you look at something like water. It's a very important necessary item. Ought to be as close to the center of the boat as you can make it. Okay, and why why do you want the ends lighter than the, the center of the boat again? Well, for example, if you're paddling into head seas, you want to keep that bow down so it slices under the waves and is well beneath the wind that's blowing toward you. Mm -hmm. Now, those are head seas. That means the waves are crashing over the bow? That's right. Okay. And in the opposite case, where you have a following sea, you want to keep the stern down heavier and keep the bow up. Mm -hmm. Okay, and again, following seas, the waves would be coming over the stern of your boat. That's right. You're going to be surfing down the face of that wave, and you really don't want that bow to bury itself. Well, you've got a good pair of hiking boots. You've broken them in well, and you're wearing two pairs of socks. But you know, after six or seven hours of hiking, it's still no guarantee that you won't get a blister. Now the first thing you'll notice is a hot spot. You want to treat it right away because that's how you're going to keep it from growing into a full-blown blister. Now, for instance, if I had a hot spot right here, what I would do is just mark the outside of my boot with my thumbnail and then pull off my boot and take the blunt edge of my, say, Swiss Army knife and go inside the boot and then just push out on the leather right at that hot spot. And what you're, of course, trying to do is stretch the leather and speed up the break-in process. You'd be amazed at how effective that technique is. But say you still have that hot spot and you want to deal with it. Well, let's get right down to the skin. First thing you do, you take an alcohol swab from your first aid kit, and you wipe that area, cleaning away all the body oils and sweat so that an adhesive will stick. Then you take a tapered, breathable adhesive, and you lay that right down over the hot spot. Now, that should pretty well take care of it. But say it does, or say you do have a blister somewhere else on your foot. Let's put a blister right there. You've got a little bit more serious problem. For that, you want to take something that's called second skin, and it's commonly available in the drug stores. You lay that down on the skin, and then you take a flexible adhesive, and you put it right over that. And that should be the end of it, except if you're in a very wet area, like here on the Milford, you might want to take some extra wide adhesive tape and go right down over that and trying to take extra care to get all the edges down firmly so they don't roll up on you. Mm, that's a pretty colorful foot job. Yeah, well fortunately it's not as bad as it looks. <laughs> <laughs> well you must deal with a lot of blisters on the Milford. One or two, yeah, yeah. you're right. Um, you pretty much covered the blister side. Yeah. Hot spots we've got a couple of Kiwi remedies. Mm -hmm. One is, you're well aware we've got plenty of sheep in this country. Oh yeah. So therefore plenty of wool around. Mm -hmm. And uh believe you've been down the pass lately. Yeah? yeah. Sore toes here? Yeah, those toes were yeah? they, they're they're really hurting. sore, eh? Okay. Let me wrap a bit of foot fleece around here. Oh, they feel better already. All right, yep. Well it's the lanolin in the wool that acts to reduce the friction. Mm hmm Okay, here we are. And because you've got in between the toes there, it keeps it in place. Oh. And then you just put All the right. sock right over that? That's the one, yeah. If you have the hot spot on your heel, Mm -hmm. We use sleek, which is a plastic tape. Right. Right, just across here. And again, because of its smoothness, it reduces the friction. Yeah. Well, that that's reminds it. me a lot of what I always carry with me for repairs of all kinds, and that's just good old everyday duct tape. Works for everything, including fixing your feet. Right. But you know, I guess the real secret is just taking care of it before it gets to be a blister. So you ready to start rubbing some sticks together? Rubbing sticks takes a long time. I'm going to show you a shortcut. Okay. We're going to use some steel wool. Steel wool? Now why is that good for starting fires? It has a coating on it that's very flammable. And so we're going to take and just start building with some small things. We can even add a little bit of lint that I find out of my pockets. Mm -hmm. And then we ignite all this. Now let's see, we're not going to use a we're not going to be using matches, so what are you going to use to start it with? Well, you carry a flashlight with you, don't you? Sure. Well, I'm going to use a battery. A battery? A How battery. is that going to start a fire? It's going to short out on the steel wool, and it's going to catch on a spark. Then we nurse the spark to where we get our fire going. Well, look at that. It really does throw a pretty good spark, doesn't it? It doesn't necessarily have to be a really uh, charged battery, does it? No. Well, that kicks up a pretty good flame. And then you nurse it and build it up as you go. All 
How's it going, John? Good. I'm just checking the tightness on this crank. You know, a new bike like this after the first day, sure enough, it's loose. That's a cool tool. Actually, that's what it's called, a cool tool. It's got everything you need for all your common road repairs. It's about ten tools all rolled into one. Take a look. That's nice and light as well. Yeah. Well, while I'm up here, I'm going to check this brake a little bit. These cable adjusters are always a little confusing to me to tight, because to tighten up this cable, you actually have to back the adjuster out. And then when you get it where you want it, you just tighten that lock nut down. Of course, what I'm trying to do is get these brake pads as close to the wheel rim as possible without touching it. Hey, why don't you give me a hand checking the true on this front wheel? Sure. Give it a spin. Well, it looks pretty good, you know. Considering all those rough roads we were on, I didn't expect it to be that true. But it doesn't need any adjustment at all. Trailside is brought to you in part by Chevy Trucks. Next time you're having fun outdoors, make sure Mother Nature has a good day too. And L.L. Bean, providing sporting gear and apparel for people who love the outdoors for over 80 years. And high-tech sports, who invite you to enjoy the great outdoors and follow the trail to adventure.